The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Jesus said, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the time will come. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your powerful spirit sweeping through the world, residing in our hearts. For we know your spirit has been at work, for we gather this day in the name of your Son to receive his gifts. We pray that you would guide us by the word this day, that through the word we know your will and through the spirit we have strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if I can ask you to kind of uh, rate things for me. Okay, so I'm going to go 0 to 10 and tell me how much you enjoy something. So if it's just absolutely out of this world for you, that's a 10. Uh, if it's something you could do without, that might be a 0 or a 1. How about a day off? Where does that fall? That 10, John. John, you're retired. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Still looking for a day off. Uh, talk to your boss, Sydney, if you would. He's looking for a day off. Uh, a, a day, and it, maybe that depends on how long it's been since you had a day off. If it's been two, three weeks, a day off is a godsend. How about cutting the grass? Anybody have that high on their list? One of the favorite things for you to do is cut grass. Or is it something that interferes when you have oh, many other things to do? How about a two-week vacation? Two-week vacation, would that get up toward eight, nine, maybe even ten? To have a break from, from the ordinary kind of days, I suppose that could do it. How about, how do you feel about waiting? Is, is that high on your list? You just enjoy, you use the, the time productively, do you? I, I, I don't know whether it's because I'm a New Yorker. It could be. That waiting just doesn't do it for me. It irritates the heck out of me. It is, in effect, a waste of time. Whether it's being in New York City and getting caught in a traffic jam, uh, whatever that experience is, it's a challenge. I got here back in 1989, and I used to live in Mandarin, and I, I would head over Bay Meadows, and when you got there 30 years ago, 31 years ago, there was a red light at the service road. So there was then the red light at Southside, but a red light at the service road. And so I'm fourth in line to make the left turn, and it got caught by a slow person at the light. And so we all stopped, and, and I'm trying to blend in with Florida, the way they do things here. And let's just be honest, that it is a lot slower than in New York. You, you go slow in New York, you're going to get pushed, okay? So, so anyway, uh, I waited there, and the light turned green. And I just about threw out my shoulder. I stopped myself, but I really was heading for the horn. Now, it really is not the fourth person in line's responsibility. It is the guy behind the guy who fell asleep at a green light. That guy is supposed to, you know, hit the horn first and his bumper second. Everybody knows that in New York. So, so I didn't know what to do. 
But I, I said, well, you know, I'm really supposed to be a Floridian now, although I'm a New Yorker visiting Florida. I, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to observe this. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and the light turned yellow and red. I was bemused. I, I, was, I was startled. I was offended. It, it was like, you know, when you're at, in a crash and, and your life flashes before your eyes. I had enough to go through my life twice in that time that it took to get to the ground. And I thought to myself, I don't care. I don't care if they throw me out of Florida. If that guy doesn't move the next green light, I'm hitting my horn hard. Well, the light turned green, and he slowly proceeded through. Now, I'm a God guy. I am. I, I preach about him. I, I pray. I, I know him. And, and I know that this is his work. He is doing this intentionally for me. I have tried to avoid waiting. I've gone on lines. Have you ever, has this happened to you? No, it's only me. There'd be like three lines, and I immediately, because I have a half German brain, count how many people clump together. This is four people, this is three people, there's, there's five people. I get on the shortest line, and I stand, and I wait, and I wait. And my brain calculates the number of people who have moved forward, and I can tell that the line I'm on, both lines would have gone down, the other lines would have been gone, and, and they would be turning the lights out. I don't know why this line is so slow. So I will, at times, move over to the other line that's moving fastest. Anybody ever done that? Does it happen to you that when you do that, somebody will come up to the uh, cashier, and they will switch places. And the person who takes over, it is their first day and their first hour. Or is it just me? Like I said, I think God is trying to train me not to, not to be bothered by waiting. And that's because, does the number 725,936 ring a bell for you? 725,963, anybody? You got that? How about if I did it this way? 1,987 years, six months, and six days. That'll ring a bell, right? No? 1,987, six months, six days. That is the day far back when Jesus left. Now, he had told his disciples that he was going to come back. The, the angels who were sitting there with those disciples said, as they were standing there, wait to catch him on the way back. Because what goes up must come down. And so they're, they're looking there. And remember what the angels said? Yo, men of Galilee, why stand you there? They spoke King James in those days. Now, why stand thee there looking up into heaven? He'll be back. Well, that's the reason we're waiting here. Now, what... Ver I will give you 253 points. Have you ever heard this before? 253 points. If you can tell me which word from Jesus they forgot that they were expecting him to return right out of the cloud and come back. What verse in Scripture recorded for us would indicate he was not coming right back? Anybody? All right, going down to 153, I'll give you a couple of hints. Jesus said there were all kinds of signs. There'd be earthquakes, the, the moon would be blotted out, the sun would be blotted out. Anybody remember when that happened? Time of Jesus? Already? When he was crucified, remember? From noon till 3 o'clock, it was blackened, and there was an earthquake when he died, and some of the saints came out of the tombs. And then it was Easter, and he said, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory and power. They saw a dead guy alive. 153 points. What verse did they forget? I'll give you 53 points, but now we're down to me telling you when he said it. Right at the end, before he left, just before he left, all authority has been given to me. In heaven and earth, go and 
make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Matthew 28, right? There's, th th this wasn't like just flowery thoughts. This was a command. Go, right? Inter uh, you know, go and make disciples of everyone, of every nation. How long would that take? They think it was, you know, they've been standing there doing nothing. So the time is going to come, but the mission is before them. They have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to go and make disciples of all nations. Have all nations been converted yet? What do we got? About 2 billion disciples of Christ, meaning 5 billion are not. Anybody know Lutheran Bible Translators? You know that organization? You, you can look it up. They're a great organization. They will send someone who has uh, linguistic skills into an area that does not perhaps even have a written language where they do not have the Bible. And they live with the people and if necessary, write down the language and then translate Greek and Hebrew into that language because there are some people in the world that cannot know about Jesus without a missionary going there and speaking their language. They translate the Bible. So the mission is not yet completed. And in reality, we have some responsibilities. You have been waiting all those years. Well, not all of them. Your entire life. And if we are sitting there like others who are not disciples of Christ, we have forgotten the mission that Christ gave us, our responsibility. So we know that there's lots of information. For a long time, people were actually believing that everything could be known. Anybody remember the 2002 commercial? You get no points for this. not really theological. But uh, back in 2002, DirecTV had a commercial. Guy is sitting at his computer in that generation, a uh, 2002 uh, computer, and he's sitting there. Uh, I think his wife was in the background. He's sitting there, and suddenly there's a bing, but bing, and either a voice, I cannot remember, a voice, or on the screen it said, congratulations. Anybody remember this? You have reached the end of the Internet. There is no more link to find. Yeah, anybody remember that? 2002 direct TV? No. It amused me. But it was, it was a feeling as if there could be this sum total of all human knowledge. And it would make us wise under the ages. We in America, with that opportunity, will know everything that needs to be known. How does that work? My uh, sister married a guy who had a brother, not, not in the high point of, of the, you know, the brightest bulb in the pack, you know, how they say those things. Anyway, he read about sardines. You know about sardines? Omega-3 fatty acids. Anybody know about that? Oh, this guy read about the sardines. And they were God's gift. I mean, this guy just said, this is tremendous. It heals this. It fixes this. It gives you brain power. It does everything. So he started eating sardines. For breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, for snacks, appetizer, didn't matter. All he ate was sardines. I wish I could complete the story, but I don't remember which hospital he ended up in. But he ended up in a hospital. That is a stupid thing to do. Your body needs more than sardines, in case you missed the point of that story. So, so the... Where does the wisdom come to the disciples of Jesus? Where would we look? The Word, right? Remember, what did the disciples do when 3,000 confessed the faith and were baptized? Remember on Pentecost, 3,000. What did they do next? Do you remember what it says? They went into homes and they listened to the apostles. There's the Word in the flesh. They're telling stories. One day there was a blind guy came walking up and Jesus healed him. Now, the interesting thing about that is the eyewitnesses were still alive. They were beginning to die, but people were there. 
So there was a day when there were thousands of people, 5,000 men plus their wives and kids on the side of a hill, and Jesus fed them with five loaves and two fish. And a guy over here, Mike, you were there. Tell us about that. And they told the stories and the wisdom of God. Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, has nothing to do with our connection to the world. The wise person has delight in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, yields fruit, and never dries up. That's the disciples of Christ. So, as Pastor said, Happy New Year. Make a resolution. Oh, you forgot. All right, how about right now? What about a resolution that says, if you have not been reading those Faith Matter devotions where we email you conveniently, 5 o'clock in the morning, the lessons for the day. Now, this isn't self-serving. I'm not trying to get you to read my stuff because for Advent, Pastor Wendell is doing the devotion, member of our church, assistant to the bishop of the NALC. And I noticed, did you notice? Did you read that? Yeah. You see how long it was? Oh, yes. He, oh, yes. my God. If you if read his in the past, it's like, it was like one paragraph in a prayer. It is now more like ours. I think we've taught him something. We, 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 I, I think, yeah. We're, okay. But, but if you don't have time to read all that, at least read the lessons. That word of God is where the wisdom comes to us. Um, is your, are anybody not busy? Is there anybody at the end of the week you said, boy, I sure had too many days in this week, you know, too many hours. How many hours? You know how many hours you got in a week? 168, except when you have 167 one day a year and 169 the other, but it balances out as 168 hours. You ever finish where you said, well, I sure got nothing to do. Society is filled with activities, lots of things for us to do. But disciples of Christ, how will we decide what it is we do? How would we know what we're called to do? I know Luther was a Roman Catholic at the time, but let me just mention, he suggested that when we wake in the morning, we make the sign of the cross. It is not copyrighted. You could do it. If you've got a spouse next to you in the bed and it would feel a little funny doing that Roman Catholic, you could just do it like, like your lip. Uh, or your forehead to say, Lord, I want to offer this day to you. I was baptized into your son, and therefore, lead me. Give me eyes and ears of faith so that as I'm going through this day, I recognize to say, I know we're Lutheran, but what James said, what kind of people are you if you think you say you're going to do this and this, and you've got it, got it planned out? What do you add to that? Lord willing, if that's your will, that's what I want to be about today. I had a professor, a Hebrew professor, uh, and he would say things like, all right, we're going to next Tuesday, we're going to have a test on those chapters, inshallah. Inshallah, anybody know? Lord willing. Lord willing. So we're going to make, I don't know, for those of you who make plans like I do, I jot down when I'm taking a shower and shaving and what this time and how long it's going to take me to drive here to there and I, I have the day planned out but I am also watching and listening for the person that I need to share with now it does I don't know if it irritates Chris but you know it's there's no such thing as just going in and going out for me because there are people there and it it's the interaction with them that's important so we can begin to develop a relationship. And we've got a relationship with stuff. Anybody got stuff? Got a garage? Got a storage place? Anybody watching? I keep advertising American Pickers. Frank and Mike, American Pickers. They go around and buy stuff, and then they sell it and make some money. And, and Chris and I will enjoy watching that, but it gets pretty sad sometimes, where somebody will open a door and it's floor to ceiling. And it's just stuff. And it was stuff that they buy to gather, believing somehow, like the bumper sticker from years ago, the one who dies with the most stuff wins. We know we're not taking it with us. What's, our, what's a disciple's relationship with stuff? Why, if that's the plan, that Christ is coming back and our responsibility is to reach out to others, what do we do with that stuff? 
How can we be content with what stuff we have? St. Paul makes it clear. I've had a little, I've had a lot. Either one is okay. I can be content because I know it's the Lord who has given it to me. Talents, abilities, resources, skills. You look at that, uh, uh, the advertisements uh, and the insert in your bulletin. And I would read it until you hear a bell, until something goes off that says, there's something I can do. The bells went off for a lot of people with all of those uh, um, gifts that were purchased to be given to the Regents Park and the, and the kids at Angel Aid. Some of those people, Jackie was uh, sharing with us, you know, there's the expectation of some of these kids, this will be their last Christmas. How will they know that God cares for them dying early in life like that? Somebody, some stranger, all right, you'd expect it from their mom or dad, but that a church somewhere, disciples of Christ, brought that care. While we're waiting for Christ's return, whose will is going to be lived out? What are you looking to do? Well, we pray about it all the time. We pray... This is what Jesus said we ought to be praying. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Remember any of you Lutherans who memorized the catechism? Remember what Luther said about those petitions of the Lord's Prayer? You, remember, it's been a while. I know we're all getting older. I got to look it up every time. Well, am I losing my battery? Or is somebody cutting you off? Is, am I done? Yeah? I'm just... I'm watching here. It sounded like I lost myself. Anyway, Luther says God's kingdom comes whether we pray about it or not. God's will is done whether we ask for it or not. Then why ask for it? Because it's the gift to us that we are part of wanting that will to be done. If we don't have a connection to Jesus, whose will rules? We want it to be ours. If it's the will of God, then then what are we doing? His will, even when we don't understand. I mean, have you, have you analyzed it? Have you figured it out? Why it makes any sense to love an enemy or pray for those who persecute you? Other than it was the command of Jesus. If you do this, I've done that at times. Oh, some people get really ticked at me. I, I can't imagine why I'm the most lovable guy. But, but nonetheless, they are really mad at me, and I love them anyway. I just, you know, partly bad memory, can't remember the bad stuff they did, what, what it was that interfered. Whether or not we understand or agree with the idea of forgiving somebody 70 times 7, that is the will of God. That's the command of God to be lived out. And when we do it, amazing things happen. Life comes where there is death. Unity comes where there is brokenness. The lesson itself for today said why all of this continues on 1,987 years, six months, and six days. Because his mission that he gave to us was to send out his angels. Anybody know the translation of the word angel? Messengers. He sent out his messengers to the four far corners of the world to come and bring people in so that they would know his will and his love. Last thing, there are people in the world, what do they think about Jesus? They're not a disciple. What really comes up today is not even sure he existed. Not even sure. I, I mean, just because some people made it up, disciples just kind of made it up and passed it around. No, I'm not sure he really existed. Though there's more written about Jesus than, than almost all the historic people combined from far distant people, many millions of people. So the Lord Jesus is the one who has come. Our relationship with him is different than, than other people in the world. Question, it's related. What people did Jesus ever baptize? You know? How many? Anybody know about how many people Jesus baptized? Were you making that zero mark? He didn't baptize anybody. Look at John 4. So why not? 
John the Baptist baptized. John the Baptist, what do you think he did? He baptized a lot of people. The disciples of Jesus were baptizing a lot of people, but Jesus didn't baptize anyone. That was a mark you were a disciple, that you were a follower of John the Baptist if you were baptized by him. Just to be a follower of Jesus, is that who we are now? Just followers? Hanging on? You know? No. Paul says, when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. He hadn't died yet. We couldn't, the disciples could not be baptized into Christ's death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might live a new life. That's what we're doing as we wait for his return. Live a life not given to us by our parents, but given to us by God himself. Reborn children of God and followers of Jesus. I pray the Lord would bless each of us. As we've waited our lifetime, we will wait and listen for the sound of the trumpet, and if it doesn't come yet, then we will listen for the cries of those around us and for the love that we can provide. I pray that gift for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a few moments to meditate on the Word and the will of God.